I think we can kick it off. Let's be Swiss about that and start the webinar. Let's do it. All right. Welcome, everybody. We're back with a very exciting analyst call. Obviously, today we want to discuss the Bitcoin halving. It's only two or three weeks until we have the next major milestone from Bitcoin. Obviously, we, we are very excited. We also just released a new report that we're just going to tease a little bit. But for the next 30 minutes, we're just going to talk about the halving, what happened in the past and how it might look like in the future. Today, I brought my wonderful colleagues. We have some originals like Lena and Kareem, but we also have a new face, which is Max, who joined the research team. So please welcome him. It's his first analyst call, but we're quite happy to have him here. All right, let's talk about the halving. It's close. So again, we released a very nice uh, Bitcoin halving report uh, a few days ago. And obviously what we want to discuss is, first of all, for some of the beginners, what is the halving actually? How does it work? Uh, what was the impact of the halving in the past? And for me, one of the biggest questions that we also get from investors, is this halving cycle different? Or is this time different? So we're obviously going to address that. We're also going to talk a bit about the unique supply and demand dynamics that currently rule around Bitcoin. And lastly, we also wanted to talk a bit more beyond the halving and what's next for the Bitcoin network. On the right side, you see our beautiful cover that our design team put together. So shout out to Neil and the rest of the team. And Obviously, we had to use the Bitcoin pizza because, as you might know, over 10 years ago, I think it was an American who spent more than 10,000 Bitcoin on, on a pizza, actually two pizzas. And we thought it's a perfect occasion to use this analogy for our newest cover, which discusses the Bitcoin halving. I hope it was tasty enough to be worth it. I hope so. I really <laughs> hope so. So to start things off, maybe Lina, you can give us like a very easy guide on how the halving actually works and what it is. Sure. Hey guys, how's it going? Happy almost April. Yeah, we start the report by giving a refresher on what is Bitcoin and what and why the halving exists. So basically for new joiners here, Bitcoin is a tamper-proof decentralized payment network. Um, and the value here accrues from thanks to the halving. And that is because the halving is essentially the halving of the reward, the, the amount of Bitcoins minted uh, per block. And that is programmed, hard-coded on the uh, back end. And that repeats every almost four years, but that is actually 200 and more accurately, it's 210,000 blocks. So every 210,000 blocks, there is an amount that gets halved. So it started with 50, uh, it, the first halving became tw 25 Bitcoins. And then fast, fast forward to today, it's 6.25 Bitcoins per block, which will be halved to 3.25 uh, Bitcoins per block. Absolutely and, right. Yeah, I think yeah. what we see here is really nicely just how the in this kind of like orange in the graph, how the Bitcoin supply increased significantly in the early days, because before it started at the beginning of 2009, there were basically zero Bitcoin in circulation. And then every 10 minutes, as Lina described, we have an issuance of new Bitcoin, which used to be 50 every 10 minutes and now is being reduced with each halving. So that's really important to understand. And it's just the significance here, and we talk about this in the paper as well. This is very different from any centralized monetary policy. The Bitcoin network and the Bitcoin monetary system, it is predefined. And this is really important because we always talk about those halvings. And in total, for your information, there will be around 32 halvings until we reach almost 21 million Bitcoin. And I think that's what a lot of people are unaware of. We always talk about 21 million Bitcoins, but to be really precise, we're actually rounding up. And that's just because 
after those 32 halvings, the last Satoshi, which is 100 millionth Bitcoin, we cannot have it any further. And that's why you, what you're on the right side is actually the exact amount of Bitcoin that will be in circulation by the end of the year 2140. So how did the Bitcoin uh, having impacted uh, the price and how did it behave in the past? The Max, uh, you want to talk a bit? Talk about this for sure. So obviously, as we just uh, discussed, the halving has, a, has an effect on Bitcoin supply side dynamics. So evidently, it would have an effect on the performance of Bitcoin as well. If we look historically, we can see that Bitcoin trades at least 50% down from its peak pre-halving. And it takes approximately, on average, 172 days post-halving to reach the old all-time high and 309 days post-halving to reach a new all-time high. However, as we all know, this industry is, is not monotone. Things always play out differently. And this happened in the last cycle as well. There was a double top post-halving in around 2021, 22, which might have surprised a lot of people. And in this case, we see an even bigger difference. On March 4th, 2024, Bitcoin broke its previous all-time high pre-halving, which is the first time in its history. This indicates why is this cycle different? What, what could be going on here that could indicate that this is playing out slightly differently to historic halving events? Yeah, I think just before we jump in into how also this cycle is different, it's always a good reminder to know that the reduction in the supply, it's not the only catalyst that leads to the, the price appreciation of Bitcoin. It's more so that it catalyzes the interest uh, in the asset class. But we have two reasons why this cycle could be a little bit different. The first being is that the whole the global economy is really dealing with inflation. This was never the case on a global scale in all the previous cycles, but also due to the historic milestone that we have reached in the U.S., which was, of course, the approval of uh, nine or ten uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs, which we can delve into over the next slide. Absolutely. That's like the big question everybody has on their mind, right? Is this time different? Personally, I hate that question because it gives me uh, PTSD from the last cycle where everybody claimed that this time it's different. And now we're facing the same question and we have to ask ourselves, is it really different this time? And I would answer yes and no. Some things are very similar. And we think that the Bitcoin halving will still show its effect. But as Kareem just alluded to, just in terms of market structure, demand and supply dynamics, Bitcoin is in a very unique position right now. And that's what we want to discuss uh, in the next couple, uh, couple of slides. Absolutely. So as you guys remember from the last cycle, we kept hearing the term institutions are here institutions are looking at Bitcoin. Of course, we've just had Tesla. Maybe that was like one of the large institutions that actually bought a little bit of Bitcoin and we saw that on their balance sheet. But we did not see this on an actual established scale. Of course, this is completely different this time because finally, after almost a year of delays or actually longer than that with the Bitcoin spot ETFs, they're now approved. And this is monumental. This is monumental for a lot of reasons. First of all, if we're just looking at how much Bitcoin was bought by the nine leading ETF issuers, it's quite huge. They have acquired more than 400,000 Bitcoin since the launch of the ETFs. This is huge for a lot of reasons. First of all, at the current moment, the annualized issuance of Bitcoin revolves somewhere around 300 and something thousand uh, Bitcoin per year. So as you can see here, the, the demand for Bitcoin just within a two months range has already eclipsed that. But then it even paints a more bullish picture because after the next holding, which is in, again in, in two, three weeks, this post issuance is going to be somewhere around 160,000 Bitcoin throughout the year. So again, this really shows that even though it's just been two months of trading or two and a half months of trading, we're seeing a lot of demand for it. But also for another reason, 
so far, the people that were the high net worth individuals and investors who have bought into Bitcoin, they are not the they're not part, for instance, of the RIAs, the registered investment advisors. These would be the kind of financial advisors who wouldn't really give the green light to trade in a newly traded asset unless they have done their due diligence. And this usually roams around 90 days. So we really haven't seen how this is still going to play out. And just as a, as a cool point of reference here, for instance, over the past month, we saw that Wells Fargo and Bank of America's Merrill Lynch, and they both just approved or they just enabled access to the Bitcoin spot ETFs. Then we heard some rumors reported by some of the news publications that Morgan Stanley was evaluating, adding Bitcoins to its brokerage platform. And then just over the last two weeks, we started to see the momentum pick up more and more. One of the wealth management platforms, the first wealth management platform actually called Citera, with almost $160 billion of AUM, they just approved the first four spot ETFs to their clients, which again, it's bullish that it hurts how much this, that the demand could look like in a, in a, couple, of, in a couple of months from now. And even Japan's uh, government pension fund, the, the pension fund that holds $1.6 trillion worth of assets, they haven't dabbled yet, but they're actively exploring if this would fit in within their 60-40 portfolio, even if at a modest 1% allocation. So again, this shows that there is really a lot of demand for Bitcoin. Uh, I don't want to get into more details about this because I want you guys to check out our report, but there were a lot of people that were sidelined. And there were a lot of surveys out there that showed that people were really willing to buy into Bitcoin once there was a registered investment vehicle. So we are here at this moment and we're looking forward to how this is going to play out. Just maybe as a last cool point, the demand acquired through the ETFs so far, we've reached almost $60 billion. That covers all the 10 spot ETF issuers. So if we look at that, we've acquired almost 60% of gold's ETF AUM. Again, in less than two months, which is a really bullish, yeah, a really bullish thing to see and a very reassuring thing to see about the demand. So here we obviously have a, a graphic indicating the number of addresses that have a non-zero balance. So just essentially the number of addresses holding Bitcoin. So adoption is clearly on a clear uptrend in the last few years. And uh, this is obviously a, a bullish signal that more investors are continuing to buy Bitcoin regardless of the price action that we've seen. This value proposition of Bitcoin as a store of value has accelerated adoption after the collapse of FTX in 2022, which explains the, the uptick in the last few years for adoption or purchasing of Bitcoin or holding of Bitcoin. And yeah. this clearly shows that they basically more and more people are experimenting with that technology. They want to their toes and aside from what prices actually do we see those wallet addresses going up also the more it's just like one tiny thing but yeah the more we we see bad actors in the industry and black swans and we see bitcoin withholding and persevering and going upwards and onwards i think this is the more investors are confident in this asset class and that they're confident in, in security basically finds the product market fit we also seen a quite an uptick in the number of transactions on the Bitcoin network. So maybe we can talk a bit like why this is happening and what this could indicate. Yeah, for, for sure. As a little teaser, we can see here we have a, a lot of large spikes in 2023 in March, September and December of 2023 in terms of the number of transactions on the Bitcoin network. And, and that shows the growing innovation on the network itself. There's more use cases now for Bitcoin beyond just a store of value, enabling an on-chain ecosystem of, of tokens and NFT-like instruments such as BRC20 tokens and, and ordinals. But uh, as we said, we want to leave some things for you to read on the report so we can touch more on this later and don't want to give away all the secrets yet. Yeah, and now if we look a bit on the supply side, just to reiterate, obviously the Bitcoin halving is acting as a supply shock to the system. Again, those block rewards are being halved. And as Kareem just mentioned, we're having the annual issuance of Bitcoin from around 330,000 Bitcoin per year to 165,000 Bitcoin. And that obviously just implies more scarcity 
which in the end drives value for the Bitcoin network. Another reason on the supply side that is really interesting, and maybe Lena, you want to talk about this a bit? Yes, sure. So long-term holders are essentially, before I delve deeper into what this chart means, so long-term holders are essentially investors who hold Bitcoin in their addresses or in their wallets for more than 155 days. And that is just a metric calculated based on the, the average. This happens to be how long uh, Bitcoin holders uh, hold uh, their Bitcoin. In December, we saw uh, the supply in uh, long-term holders' wallets have spiked to almost 15 million Bitcoin. As we can see here, that was in December. And it declined a little bit, like five, like 4% to a little over 14 million Bitcoins. And that is a, really a trend that we've seen over the past few halvings where long-term holders tend to sell a little bit of their holding just to for profit-taking measures. But on the other hand, short-term holders have also accumulated also millions of Bitcoins. Currently, it's, I think, a little over 3 million uh, Bitcoins. And that is actually 33% growth from, yeah, that has surged 33%, but that is in the short-term holders and that is just a way to exhibit or showcase how uh, the balancing mechanism between uh, both cohorts play out to see how sustainable this network is and how the supply and demand uh, come into play. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just amazing to see and what we can and identify on-chain and using on-chain analytics. Because you just, if you look at that orange line here on the graph, which indicates long-term holder supply, we can see how they behave basically through those cycles, right? Usually in a bear market, they hold on to their assets, while when a bull market really picks up, they sell into strength. And here, obviously, it's a combination of people. Imagine you invested in the previous cycle, you hold your coins, you didn't want to get rid of it because you hope they are coming back. And once basically we're at higher prices, some of those people might sell. But we clearly see that more and more people hold on. And that's why we see this trend clearly going to the right top. And as Lina perfectly explained this, basically, this is almost 70% of the entire Bitcoin circulating supply. So over 70% of Bitcoin circulating supply hasn't moved for over 155 days. And that obviously indicates illiquid supply, which kind of like plays perfectly into those demand and supply dynamics of Bitcoin at the moment. What about balance on exchanges? Bitcoin balance on exchange is also is in decline, actually. And that only means that investors are holding more onto their assets. And currently at 3.3 million, it's currently at a five-year low. That is, that is a huge indicator of how valuable Bitcoin is in the, in the eyes or how more valuable Bitcoin is in the eyes and the wallets of investors. Yeah, there's, there's no clear indicator that investors are holding more onto Bitcoin than ever in the last five years. Karim, did you have anything to add? Maybe just adding a, point to, a couple of points of references here. Uh, as you guys can see from like the beginning of 2023, as we all would love to forget, but it's a memory that we really can get rid of when the FTX collapse happened, as Lena has also gratefully mentioned, people were really quite scared about crypto. Generally speaking, they were looking for the safest asset, the one that is considered the most decentralized and distributed and is not, doesn't have a lot of murky question marks around it. As we can see from here, that's really when the trend really started accelerating. We saw the drop here from almost 2.7 to 2.8 million to almost 2.3 million. And then again, as we as Bitcoin really started bottoming before the banking crisis in 2023, this once again began catalyzing the idea and catalyzing the interest in the idea that we need to become our own bank. We can't leave the safest asset on exchanges or in platforms. So the best way to deal with this is really to just get hold of it, to withdraw it to your own non-custodial wallets, which would not be affected by any kind of bankruptcies or platform failures or anything. And or then, of course, exactly, use, our e use ETFs or ETPs, which might offer a safer uh, way to invest in crypto as well. 
Absolutely. You front ran my next book. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, again, this is another indicator. I know a lot of charts, but it's just so interesting to see what's going on chain. And what we see here is the so-called NUPL, uh, Bitcoin's net unrealized profit and loss. And we love to say that it's like a, a psychology indicator. It really reflects the sentiment in the market because what it actually shows is if the entire Bitcoin network is in a profit or in a loss at the moment. And that usually goes hand in hand and are we getting too greedy or are we too fearful? And if you just look at the past cycles, if you look at the tops in 2018 or the last top in 2021, we clearly see this NUPL indicator spiking above 0.7. And that kind of like historically speaking, always indicated the top. The same applies vice versa, basically just slowing when we could have had good entry points just based on NUPL. Now, if we look at the halving, basically, especially in the last two halvings, we can see that NUPL was a bit on, a, on the lower end. But obviously, because we already reached new all-time high pre-halving, we also see a higher NUPL at this point. However, we can also see that we might be at higher territories. There's still room for more growth, just looking at this on-chain indicator. And that's okay. We might be in a bull market already, but it's still in the early innings based on this here. And it's wonderful to see it because NUPL is a relative metric. So considering the fact that we saw the same exact level prices or we're at a higher level range right now, a higher price range right now, but considering the fact that we've reached pretty much more or less the same levels, but we don't see the same levels of greed, even though you would feel it, that this shows that people really haven't piled in to Bitcoin as of yet. And it shows that the rally still has more uh, room to grow, we think, over the next month. Absolutely. Now we just like discuss because it's really unique for Bitcoin at the moment. And that is one of the main reasons why we're already seeing all-time highs prior to the halving. Because on the demand side, obviously, it looks like we're having an improving macro environment. Uh, we just saw the announcement by the Fed that they're going to slow down their balance sheet reduction. Obviously, as we discussed, the ETF buying pressure, which is really immense, it highly outpaces the Bitcoin issuance. And then obviously, smaller retail investors, we see continuous adoptions and Th those people are really unfazed by, by market prices in general. That's really on the demand side. But then looking on the supply side, as uh, Lina discussed, long-term holder supply, 70% of the Bitcoin circulating supply has moved for over 155 days. Very illiquid. Then we have decreasing balance on exchanges. Another way where people basically withdrawing their coins from exchanges to hold on to that. And lastly, obviously, we do have the Bitcoin having supply shock, which again reduces the issuance and therefore the supply of Bitcoin. And if we just look at the dynamics here, we can clearly see it almost indicates some sort of supply squeeze because on one hand, the supply is coming down. But on the other hand, if demand keeps on going up, we, we could run into a supply squeeze at one point. But yeah. let me ask you, the researchers here, how do you think it will behave during the halving and how would the next six to 18 months look like, basically? What's your opinion? I think we're in an uncharted territory, to be honest. There is really no precedence to, to build on, which is why Bitcoin is going to be superbly exciting moving forward. I, I don't want to, again, spill the surprise of, of the last slide, just showing how much Bitcoin is actually growing beyond just its original value proposition and, and use case. But it's exciting. It's exciting because I really do think we're in for a supply squeeze. It's unfortunate because it's quite, quite difficult to get an actual estimate about how much, how much of the liquid supply of Bitcoin is available. Just because there is a lot of Bitcoin that is lost, there's a lot of Bitcoin that, that is held or gets traded in quite a cyclical manner, in a cyclical manner between short-term and long-term trading. 
but nevertheless, if really, the, and I think that's the biggest thing that we all need to be aware of, if the demand for ETFs continues uh, on the same rate that we have seen, I think we're in for a surprise over the next year or so. We've always talked about the supply squeeze, but we might actually see it happen this cycle. Yeah, yeah. It's quite nice to see because we've been talking about this for the last 12 months, especially, that there's this build up and it's just nice to see it play out finally, Definitely. at least to a small extent for now. Lina, what do you think? How is how it's going to be the next six months? Yeah, it's going to be crazy. I think it's the it's exact opposite of the last when having. I think when it coincided with the, with the China ban. But but it's like the exact opposite, even like a graphic opposite. So yeah, it's going to be exciting to see what's going to happen. I do expect some fluctuations, of course, especially during like a hot time, but uh, like some volatility. But uh, yeah, I, I say in the next five five months following the halving, I think we can easily break 100K. That's no financial advice, obviously. Yeah, no financial advice. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I just want to remind people also of something. We didn't really delve into the chart, like how Bitcoin has been looking like for the past six to eight years. But this cycle, specifically the last six months, the, the drawdowns of Bitcoin has been a lot less shallow than any other previous cycle, which if anything, it really implies that there is a continuous demand for the asset, which is quite unique. And specifically over the last three to four months, Bitcoin has been in an up only mood. Like it, 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 if it ends this month on the green higher than I think seventy six thousand, it's going to be a record uh, of going essentially increasing for over seven months. Bitcoin has never done that. Yeah, and it's quite powerful. No, I one hundred percent agree with you. Again, like it, it, there are some risks as well. Obviously, we will see pullbacks in every Bitcoin bull market. We we will see violent pullbacks, maybe not to that extent, as you mentioned okay. in the past, but just the nature of the asset. Obviously, volatility has been coming down significantly over more than 10 years, but it's still Bitcoin. So we, we do expect pullbacks that are significant, especially what's really important is just to look at open interest. We've seen this with the last pullback as well. There's just a lot of leverage traders coming in, a lot of speculators. And therefore, once we have a bit of those ETF outflows that kind of indicates a pullback, suddenly a lot of people get liquidated and that amplifies a move to the downside or upside. But that's really when this leverage buildup happens. And Max, what's your opinion on the next six to 18 months? Yeah, I, I agree with the things that Kareem and Lena pointed out. Obviously, we're seeing uh, exogenous demand for this asset, uh, and it's only grown with the ETF buying pressure. Um, but as you guys touched upon, I wouldn't be surprised to, to see certain drawbacks or, or pullbacks when there will be profit taking uh, taking place. Naturally, we saw this a, a few days ago or weeks ago. I don't know, time moves so fast now, but when Bitcoin reached 70K, Two minutes later, it was immediately down immediately. So it's no surprise we see profit taking and at these points where they would naturally occur when Bitcoin reaches these new milestones, which it hasn't previously seen. But again, as you guys touched upon, we have seen volatility decrease in every cycle. And I think this would be the same, but overall uncharted territory, but really exciting tree. Uncharted territory in a positive way. Yeah, I'm really excited. Likewise, I totally agree. And again, I think people have to remember, you got to look at the bigger picture. A lot of investors, they freak out when we have a massive pullback because we're very short-sighted sometimes. And, and therefore, it's really important to zoom out, take a deep breath and look at the long-term vision and also like the, the entire dynamics that at the moment, at least, paint a pretty bullish picture. And... But yeah, and, and remember that pullbacks are beneficial for two reasons. First of all, it allows more people to join in, people who have not had the chance to, to invest in the asset class. But two, and more importantly, it, it helps Bitcoin regain its market structure. Because if something just keeps going up relentlessly, then it doesn't build organic levels of support as the asset grows, which is, again, we should appreciate it because the faster it goes, 
the faster it falls. That's just more like a trading expression, but something to always keep on the back of your mind as you see the mania of yeah. the Bitcoin frenzy. I think now it's time to talk a bit more beyond Bitcoin. I know, Karim, you're very excited about, about that, rightfully. But of course, Bitcoin established itself as like that emerging store of value, like a hedge against currency debasement. It's an asset that is limited in supply and there's no other asset like this in this world. Uh, however, even though a lot of people sometimes call Bitcoin a bit boring, I think there's actually a lot of innovation happening on top. And I think that's underestimated and people should definitely pay attention to that because we see the early innings of something very exciting building up. So Kareem, what's going on on Bitcoin? Explain it a little bit and how does it tie in with the halvings maybe as well? Why it's so important? Absolutely. First of all, Bitcoin is not a comp by nature or in its original form. Bitcoin doesn't allow really for complex type of applications to emerge on top of its network. It was from the beginning, since its inception, it was designed as a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, cash payment system. However, we have really been seeing a lot of small incremental adjustments uh, that have happened to Bitcoin, but they've really caught the, uh, the, a lot of developers' attention. Uh, specifically at the beginning of last year. So just because of the fact that Bitcoin was quite limited in its usability, we saw certain networks that were building on top of Bitcoin, things like Stacks, for instance, where rather than allowing certain applications and tokens to be deployed directly on Bitcoin, uh, it would emerge on this complementing layer, uh, if you may. So Stacks has been around for a really long time. Stacks has been, and its main net went live about two years ago, but the network itself was being developed since 2018. But Stacks was, I would say, the really the leading solution here. Because again, yeah, just because of how early they have been around. However, with some of those small incremental changes that I was just talking about, certain developers were able to, for lack of better words, use a loophole and allowing new types of transactions to emerge on top of Bitcoin. And this gave the idea to what is now known as ordinals. So ordinals, the best way to think about it is that they are the NFT-like equivalent of what's on top of Ethereum. But it's actually, it's a lot more superior. And it's quite surprising for people who are not well aware of this. Because NFTs on Ethereum, the NFTs itself doesn't necessarily live on top of the network. The image could be living somewhere else, but the NFT points at it. While with ordinals on top of Bitcoin, whatever type of media that you are looking at, whether it's a picture, whether it's a video, whatever type of media that we are talking about, it actually lives on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. So why is this significant? And this is significant because as we've clearly highlighted throughout this presentation, Bitcoin, once it reaches 2140, where every four years, the amount of newly generated units of BTC, it keeps decreasing, which essentially means that for the miners that are supporting the security validation of the network, once this block subsidy or once this economic sub subsidy program, once it ends, there isn't really any type of incentive for them to keep supporting the network. So that essentially means that they need a new type of revenue, which as we can see from the chart on the right here, if the block rewards goes down, but the transaction fees are starting to grow, then this acts like a neutralizing balancing act. So that's the first cool aspect about what we saw specifically over the last year. But what was even more, more exciting and more thrilling is the fact that this, again, this loophole that I was talking about that allowed for more complex type of transactions to emerge on top of Bitcoin itself. Now this is giving a way to an insanely expensive ecosystem of new networks that are emerging on top of Bitcoin. So what do I mean by that? Just like Ethereum has its own layer two landscape, things like Arbitrum and Optimism and Polygon, all the networks that are anchored to the security of Bitcoin, but they help scale the limitations of Ethereum. We're now seeing the same thing with Bitcoin. And it's quite exciting because a lot of them well, have been developed or were being looked at over the past year or so. But really, this trend just accelerated so much uh, throughout last year specifically. 
And now we are starting to see a plethora and a plurality of networks that it was not even thought that this was possible uh, 12 months ago. Why is this crucial? Again, we could start to see more and more things being done on top of Bitcoin, things like DeFi applications, things like social media applications, even games in certain areas. We saw a couple of early models of the equivalent of a Google Drive and OneDrive uh, on top of Bitcoin. All of that is now starting to become more and more possible because of this new loophole that was exploited by the developers. And when I say exploited, it doesn't have a negative connotation here. It just means that they were able to use a specific technical limitation to their advantage to enable more things to happen on top of Bitcoin. So that's wonderful because, again, we don't want to overload the underlying Bitcoin network, but we most certainly want to see more innovations and more applications built on top of it. Yeah. First of all, because we want Bitcoin to become more exciting, since it is the most decentralized network, we want it to be the settlement layer for more and more things to happen. And we want the miners who are the bedrock at the foundation of this network allows it to be the most secure Apple store, if you may. We call that Ethereum, the global app store. But if we want Bitcoin to become the, the most secure global app store, then we want miners to be, we want them to be well off financially speaking. And with this kind of thing, that's exactly the direction that we are, that we're headed towards. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. And me personally, I'm very excited about stacks as well, especially because it brings that smart contract capabilities to the most decentralized settlement layer, which is Bitcoin. And also they have a really important upgrade coming, the so-called uh, Nakamoto uh, upgrade. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this, this Nakamoto release will basically, I think one feature is definitely SBTC, which is like a native two-way pack for Bitcoin. And what it essentially means is that you can use your Bitcoin for instance, as collateral to take out loans. Maybe we see yield generated for Bitcoin. And that's obviously a game changer because most of us, including us here, we don't really utilize our Bitcoin. Bitcoin is really something that you store its value, you barely touch it. However, with something like Stacks, it really unleashes almost a trillion dollars of market cap of Bitcoin which is absolutely fantastic. So for any investor that is looking for a bit more beta on Bitcoin, I think Stacks is something that sh people should take a look at. And it's confirmation time, how fast it is. Mm -hmm. that I'm talking specifically about the Nakamoto upgrade. One of Bitcoin's biggest disadvantages is how long it takes for transactions to be settled and confirmed on the blockchain. With Stacks, it's going to go down from more than 30 minutes in certain cases to less than a minute, which is a significant improvement. And, you know, the, even though it's not still as fast as some of the other blockchains that exist at the moment, it's still a massive improvement that we should appreciate because, again, it, lays the, it lays the foundation for, for more sophisticated and more exciting things to, to happen on top of Bitcoin, just in terms of applications. Absolutely. As you can see, obviously, this webinar is about the, the, the having its impact, um, the current demand and supply dynamics. But we are especially excited what's actually build, being built on top of the Bitcoin network, because this is like a more sustainable, long standing vision that is, is unfolding at this point. And it plays in the favor of the supply and demand dynamics of Bitcoin as well. Absolutely. If there is less Bitcoin that is available for people to buy, just to store, but on the other side, you have more and more people using it, just, just like they use ETH to access its ecosystem, then it, it, it hurts to even imagine how bullish things will be for Bitcoin over the long term or the medium term. Awesome. I think we're at time. We're just going to open it up for a bit of Q&A. So if you have any questions, we're, we're happy to tackle them. Uh, oh, wait, maybe one thing I have to make a shout out because you, you know that we do love Dune Analytics. We have especially our wizard Tom who builds amazing dashboards. And obviously for the having, we built a, a dashboard as well. Here you have an analysis of when is the estimated date of the next halving. And as we can see at the moment, it's the 19th of April. How many days? how many blocks there are left until the halving. It also like drills down a bit to each cycle. 
just showing like how was the performance after e each uh, Bitcoin halving event and much, much more. And obviously we also have our Bitcoin key metrics that is just more like a general overview of Bitcoin, looking at correlation to gold, volatility, yeah, coin revenue fees basically, and much, much more. So make sure to check out our Dune Analytics dashboards and leave us some stars as well. And lastly, here we have the QR code, which is if you want to download the Bitcoin halving report. And other than that's it from us. And if you have any questions, please let us know. We have one question, which is basically what happens if miners switch from mining to renting out their machines to AI developers? I would say there are two different things. So with AI, I don't want to get too technical. <laughs> that's a quick cool question though. The type of machinery that is used for Bitcoin mining is very much different from the type of machines that is required to support training LLMs, which are large language models of AI. With AI, you need GPUs, graphical processing units. With Bitcoin, you need ASICs, application-specific integrated units, which is, for lack of better words, they're just two, two types of different hardwares and they can't really replace each other. Each one is more specifically tailored for a specific use case, if I would say. So they can't really overlap, if I were to give a simple answer to this. No, I think that's good. The next question we have is, what strategy do I use to find the next big crypto narrative before people start knowing about them? That's on-chain data. On-chain data is really your best, your best tool here. That's the beauty of blockchain, of the blockchain economy, honestly, and the crypto economy. You don't need to wait for financial reports coming out every three months to see how, how certain companies are doing. You're able to see the increased adoption in terms of the uptick of users, in terms of the increased revenue. The, your entry point, I would say, is Dune. Dune has a lot of magnificent and, and, and a really expensive suite of dashboards that covers things if you would, for instance, to see a dashboard that includes all the projects that are related to AI, you could start to group them in one way or the other, and then you could start to compare them sector by sector. That's one way to look at it. But also in terms of revenue, like Dune, Dune is more, it's a more nerdy platform. I would say if you are on a personal basis, if you don't have your own SQL skills, you would need to check out other dashboards. But there are other data analytical websites where you are able to just query the, again, type of the growing revenue. DeFi Llama, I would say, is actually one of the best platforms that anyone can use because it has a very user-friendly interface where you're able to see things like the TVL, which is the AUM uh, of crypto. And it also has a bunch of different indicators like TVL over market capitalization, you could also th see things like the inflow of stable coins, which is a really good indicator because at the end of the day, if you are seeing stable coins flow into a new network, then it means that there are new users depositing their money into this network, which usually indicates that there is something new and something trendy about it. Um, that That is a signal that you can spot ahead of time and you can capitalize on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. I would also highlight, I think socials are still very important to spending a lot of times on socials, especially Twitter or X. Uh, and th this kind of like just to sense out a potential new narrative. Obviously, it's hard to not be late to the party. But I think sometimes if you follow the right people or you get into a rabbit hole that could be an indication for a new narrative, then you might be early uh, to the game. We have one more question, uh, and it is about quantum computing. So is Bitcoin quantum computing resilient? It's a work in progress, I would say. We have it, we, we're not in the era yet where quantum computing is accessible to anyone. So that's just a threat that is not very viable at the moment. But there are active discussions that are being led by the Bitcoin developer community where they're looking at certain strategies and certain mechanisms that would help strengthen Bitcoin's security. Yeah, it's definitely possible. There are some blockchains, for instance, like Algorand, that apparently are already like quantum resilient. And all it takes is basically the Bitcoin network to agree on that they will have an upgrade and therefore become quantum computing resilient. 
again, as Karim said, we might be a few years away from that. But I always find that if quantum computing really becomes big, like the Bitcoin network is 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 the lesser, it's a smaller problem to have. Just thinking <laughs> about all the uh, military secrets, my bank account, all <laughs> my personal data, which are definitely not as secure as the Bitcoin network as of now. So obviously it's important for Bitcoin, but I think it's for a lot of other systems and networks that need to upgrade to make sure they're resilient to this new technology. But the world of cryptography is evolving day in and day out. And there are, yeah, again, despite the fact that there are other networks that are adopting this, yeah, the world of cryptography is evolving at a insane pace. And there are, again, just that's not... I don't think we will have the time to get into some of those <laughs> mechanisms that are being developed, but there are th primitive, certain primitives that are for sure being looked at <laughs> that could help. Uh, point. Yeah, we're pretty close on time, but obviously we're also going to have a, a, a quick Q&A by the end of this webinar. If there's anything you would love to see, or maybe you want to see Kareem talking about the different mechanics he just alluded to, please let <laughs> us know. Uh, but other than that, make sure to download our report, reach out to us with feedback. And other than that, we wish you yeah, a good rest of the day and obviously a nice journey into the next Bitcoin having and beyond. And with that being said, thank you, Kareem. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Max. And until the next time. Oh, we have pleasure. Thank you, Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye. See you post-hoping. <laughs>